<laughs> Good morning, campers. Welcome to Radio Camp Haplet, a Percy Jackson Reeling podcast. I am your host, Zach. And I'm B. And this week, we have a very special bonus episode for you guys. Now, B, I think both of us are in our 20s, right? I mean, some people think that I'm either a child or an ancient elf, but you know. Yes, I am in my 20s. No, the crazy thing about Percy Jackson is when I started reading them, they were just when they were coming out. So I was probably like 10. And now I've talked to people that like, Percy Jackson didn't even come out when I was born. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm the Crypt Keeper. (laughs) But the interesting thing is like from a kid's perspective all the way up to an adult, especially with you just being an adult, is that it's weird to think about sometimes we kind of not neglect, but we kind of forget that, you know, kids read these books. But also the most important thing about them is, is that kids get really super excited to read these books and they want to share them with their parents. Because sometimes, like, I remember as a kid, like, showing my mom this cool pet rock that I bought for, like, $10. Yeah, that's something I did as a kid. Kids are enthusiastic, for sure. Um, especially about books. I, I think my sister can attest that she... Knows the entire plot of A Series of Unfortunate Events just from my babbling that I did against her will. Now, the interesting thing about us is that neither of us have kids. So it's like kind of like we can't really we we don't know how to really talk about that. I mean, I guess we could get kids, but I don't have a butterfly net big enough to actually catch a kid. (laughs) Like the child snatcher from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Yeah, exactly. Little children I have Rick Riordan in this van. Well, I know some kids that probably would jump into that van already. Don't do that. We're not advocating that. Well, I also know a couple of adults if you have like, hey, I have Winds of Winter up in here that hop into your van, no questions asked. Uh, but we actually have some very special guests today, someone that can actually bridge the gap between uh, them having kids, but also being parents themselves that love Percy Jackson. Now, these people I love to death because they are one of my favorite podcasts, The Duke and Duchess. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Liz. Hi, I'm Chad. We're the Duke and Duchess podcast. Thank you guys so much for having us on. And we are really excited to represent Generation X over here. That's Booyah. right. We need the representation. Oh, uh, yeah, Generation X. <laughs> yeah, we're kind of missing Gen X representation because we have a lot of listeners who are probably like Gen Z and then we're millennials. So we're kind of, we're missing that. I don't even think some people forget about Gen X is because they always go to OK Boomer. Yeah, it's true. Gen the X? forgotten generation. OK Millennials. <laughs> Oh, man. A forgotten generation. That's a Star Wars generation. Yeah, we have right forgotten the child. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, but it's so exciting to have you guys on here because uh, much like you guys, you guys also do a book podcast very similar to us where I believe you guys read a fantasy book. One of you hasn't read it and the other one has. Is that correct? Yep. That is the format. Yep. So, Chad and Liz, why don't you kind of introduce yourself, especially with you know podcasting, but also being parents yourselves? Certainly. So uh, we host the Duke and Duchess podcast. And uh, like like you stated, we're a book club podcast with the same sort of general premise. One has read what one hasn't. Uh, Liz is always the one who has read because she's read everything in the fantasy and sci-fi genres that's out there. And I'm the one that's typically exposed to it for the first time. Uh, And we've been doing our podcast now for about two and a half years and um, maybe three, actually, coming up on three. And right now we're covering uh, Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson. We have covered uh, numerous other books, The King Killer Chronicles, and also Scott Lynch's Gentleman Bastards. Yes, and we are also currently doing the side project of raising four children. Side project. <laughs> side project. Side pro- it's, a, it's your a side quest. Right. Rose of that side project. Uh, our kids are... 14, 12, 10, and 8, respectively. So right in that YA wheelhouse, basically. Oh, yes. And and it's it's amazing getting to start to share some of our favorite series with them. You know, I was an adult when Harry Potter started coming out. I was in college. So I, but I've always loved YA uh, books. I've, you know, a well-written YA book. Um, I, I really think that there's a lot that that genre can do in terms of storytelling that that others don't. And I, I really appreciate, I, I always kept that in my repertoire. So I love the Percy Jackson books and my, my kids all love them. And when we told them we were going to go on a Percy Jackson podcast, they were like, oh my God. <laughs> that's so cute. That, that sounds like the correct response to anything in life. <laughs> that sounds like most Percy Jackson yeah. fans also. They're, they're known for their <laughs> enthusiasm. Like they just so rip off their shirt guys... and then they have an orange shirt already underneath. Yes. Yeah. They're just ready. <laughs> with their, camp, with their 
cabin number. Um, so how did you guys get like introduced to Percy Jackson? Was it like your kids finding it first? In my case, that's that's what it was. Our our twelve year old, uh, our only our only male progeny. He found the books, and and I was very very excited for him to read because he was the one I thought that may not be a reader, and all the other girls are. Uh, but when he found these books, he just tore into them. And like Liz explained earlier in one of our side conversations, we spent months where he and I would just go out in the yard and throw the football around, and he would explain the books to me in excruciating detail. Uh, and it was it was great, and I was uh, very relatable. glad that he found something he enjoyed. See, that's like the power of reading, really. It's like, yeah. uh, what's the old saying? Like, there's no such thing as like a person that doesn't read. They just haven't found the right book mm-hmm. yet. Mm-hmm. And that's one of those where it's like, it's a truly magical thing, especially for me. Like, I actually had gotten out of reading for a long time, and I remember probably 13 or 14, I picked up actually um, the Night Angel trilogy by Brent oh, Weeks, and so I started good. tearing through yeah. it. It's it's funny, too, because Percy Jackson definitely seems like one of those series that like even kids who aren't necessarily into reading get into because it's sort of structured in the way of like, All of the main characters have dyslexia and ADHD. They themselves kind of have, like, difficulties with, like, reading and learning disabilities and things like that. So I think that coupled with kind of, like, a more approachable writing style, it it tends to, like, bring people in who might not necessarily be, like, a reader, quote unquote. Sometimes it actually kind of feels like a Ponzi scheme at times where it's, like, (laughs) Rick Ryden's, like, I wrote it at the right age where all these people are, like, learning mythology right now. And this is how I make it so much fun. He's tricking you into learning. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) So true. And his prose is... Uh, he writes a really good opening sentence I'll say Mm. there's always something really catchy he's got a hook and I I think that combined with the fact that that thematically there's so much for kids that age to connect to in these books it it really it really does have a special place I think in in a lot of kids reading history nowadays you have to make your kids read it's like i don't remember doing this when i was a kid but nowadays kids have to read a certain amount of time a certain number of chapters they have to write a, this tedious horrible reading log you know and it just it's like we suck the fun out of something amazing i feel like that happened around the time that zach and i were in school that's how i actually started to really fall in love with harry potter was because i had to do those stupid like you have to read the book and then go on the internet <laughs> mm-hmm. and like fill it like what did you like <laughs> yeah. about the book and then I slowly like, oh, this will be easy because I could just cheat because it's easy to read these <laughs> books. And then I kind of fell in love with them. Liz, I have a question for you because the great thing about Percy Jackson as well is they have some of the best chapter names ever. <laughs> what is your favorite chapter name? I wouldn't know. Oh, my gosh. I, I, <sighs> There's so I many weird ones. I wish I had um, the, the – hold on. Let me grab my book. Um, I'm going to have to pull them up. I, I'm currently – so I told you guys I just – um, I just did a reread of the first series and I had actually never read the second series, um, but I picked it up as well. And my, um, my son was so excited, um, that I was reading the second series cause he actually started with that one and he liked it more. And so he's been following me around nonstop saying, um, <laughs> what part do you want? What when part do you want? reading, what part do you want? <laughs> Um, that's really great. See, that's such a great bonding experience as well. It's like your kid looked really engaged in that way of like they're actually really asking you, did you get to this uh-huh. part? And then you guys talk about it, which is so it great. It honestly must be really cool to have parents who like to read fantasy and YA because I don't ever remember my mom like reading the same books as me. She'd be like reading the Da Vinci Code while I was reading like <laughs> Lemony Snicket. Like they were not the same books at all. Oh, Lemony Snicket is so great. Uh, okay, so some of my favorite. I pulled up the chapter. Names. Some of my favorites were, um, well, okay, I wrestle Santa's evil twin. That was a great chapter. That one was good. That one's yeah. a great chapter. Very confusing as a chapter title. I remember, because, you know, at the end of every episode, Zach asks me to guess what's going to happen based on the chapter title. And I was like, Zach, I don't know. I, are they going to meet Santa? Is this going to be like a Chronicles of Narnia situation? Is it literally Santa Claus? I wouldn't put it past this. And series. then I, I get into the second series and all the chapter names are just... The names of the characters. You know, one, yeah. two, three, four, Nico, yeah. Piper, mm-hmm. whatever it is. And it's funny because it, you lose some of that charm, but also when you're reading the second series without spoiling anything, you know, it's a much darker series. So it kind of makes more sense. It's a little bit like that as well. But it, it's so funny because you look at the first series and you can instantly see why a kid, you know, truly, truly does enjoy it. And now, um, how has Percy Jackson kind of influenced both your children's lives, but also yours? Because... Percy Jackson sounds like it's a huge part of your guys' just normal culture in your house. One of the things I love about it is 
all of our kids enjoy reading, and they enjoy reading in the sci-fi fantasy fantasy genre, but Percy Jackson is the only one that I can think of that all of them have read. Now, our youngest hasn't read it yet. She's not quite the right age, Mm -hmm. but the older three have all read it, so it's the only one, to my knowledge, that all three of them share. There are other ones that two of them have read together, uh, but even though it's all kind of in the same genre, they still have sort of their sub-interest, so it's a good sort of focal point where they can all agree and all talk about and have a common touchstone. Right. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Like I kind of what I was saying is it's kind of designed to be approachable in some ways. Like there's always there's something that kind of anybody can take from it, whether it be you're interested in mythology, you're interested in like history, you're interested in action. There's kind of like a little something for everyone. Yeah. It's almost like the like the gateway drug, so to speak, about getting into like harder (laughs) fantasy. Like I probably would go from this to like your kids go from reading Percy Jackson, you know, the Lucifer's Lettuce, all the way up to like Stormlight Archives. Like, Daddy, I want to read a thousand page book that could stop a bullet. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would say, too. I mean, even our we talked about our, our son, our 12 year old, but also I would say our 10 year old who always has enjoyed reading. But I feel like when she got into Percy Jackson, that was kind of like the gateway to just being an uber nerd. Um, which we approve of. Which we have like, we're like, yes, come on. <laughs> Join us. <laughs> you like you dust off your copies of Firefly yes. yeah. and Star Wars and just start crying. Like I'm so Soon. proud. It is sort of a constant challenge as parents who are trying to actively cultivate nerds to try to find the right <laughs> the right balance of things that we want them to read that are also age appropriate. Yes. You know, and it's yeah. um which is why I, I you know, I, I appreciate good quality YA literature and I appreciate things like uh, authors like Brandon Sanderson who you know you, you know, for kids who are especially for kids who are kind of read above their age level, um, as far as the, their vocabulary and everything, but you don't necessarily want the content. Um that a lot of adult books have. Yeah, you show them something like um, Alcatraz versus the Evil Librarians, which is actually a really fun book. Mm-hmm. Oh, he hint, would hint. love that. <laughs> yeah, hint, hint. Or something <laughs> even like, I think, it's interesting because you talk about how, you know, you want to look in your kids' age range, and this is something for us, is like, uh, when we were kids, I'm especially for you guys as well, it's like, there was no such thing really as that. It was just like, just yeah, pick up YA some book and kind figure of a, it out. a new genre in some ways. Like, there was kids' literature. It's like this kind of weird niche market thing that has happened pretty historically recently. Like, I know for me, the specific, it's like, I went from Goosebumps, and it was like, oh, yeah, if you want to read the really scary stuff, you read R.L. Stein's <gasps> teen fiction. You read, like, Fear Street and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> or Christopher Pike. Like, that stuff, like, I remember reading it later. I'm like, you know what? I kind of think Goosebumps is scarier. And it's like, oh, there's that teen factor to it, I guess. Right. Well, a lot of people say R.L. Stein is, like, the precursor to, um, like, Stephen King. No, there's a funny quote. It's like, he's the training bra to Stephen King. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. It's, but, I mean, content-wise, like, I wouldn't suggest someone go from reading, like, goosebumps to maybe it or something like even though there's kids in that there's some stuff that might not be great (laughs) for children to read Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and we won't get into that and specific large things of that you know that coca-cola filled dream of his that is it (laughs) i don't think when when we were kids there really wasn't like you said ya as an established genre but in sort of the fantasy sci-fi sci-fi realm we had dragon riders of pern Mm -hmm. oh yeah and we had you know, we had what's there's another one I'm thinking of. Dragon that, Lance Chronicles. That's what dragons I was going to say. Bane. You read my mind. A lot mind. of dragons <laughs> happening. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of dragons and chicks in metal bikinis. That yeah. was the '80s. Yeah, that sounds Absolutely. about right. <laughs> that was the fantasy in the '80s. Um, so me and Zach wanted to ask you guys. I mean, I don't know if both of you have an answer to this question, but who are your godly parents? Well, I mean, obviously Athena, right here. Obviously, obviously, obviously. <laughs> I think Chad is yeah. probably a Hermes. If I had to pick one for him, oh, Ooh. interesting choice. Um, just because of his his, um, I would say, joking, playful nature. Not that he steals stuff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> anymore. <laughs> just putting him on blast. Yeah. But also, Chad. You know, Chad would so happily, like, if I said, "Let's do it." He would buy a massive RV and pack our entire family up and drive across the country for the rest of our life. Like he would, he would be so. And and Hermes, you know, is the god of travelers. He would be on the road for the rest of our lives. If I said let's buy a tiny house on wheels and go, he'd be like, "I yes. already have a Pinterest." 
<laughs> it, it's really interesting like what other people say like what your godly parent would be like I remember when I first started reading this series I like had no idea what my godly parent I had like no interpretation of any of the gods so then I think Zach like said something like oh I think you're Apollo and I'm like I don't know what that means and then as I've read it I'm like oh I get uh-huh. why you said that wait so what is Zach Zach who who is yours oh so originally for the longest time I was a child of Athena but going through this book series one more time I'm actually uh, probably a son of Hephaestus. Mm. Yeah. Because like I tinker. MacGyver everything. Yeah, nice. you're kind of both of those things for sure. There's like it, That's like the weird thing, though, we've talked about this, where a lot of like YA does this strange like sorting thing of like, mm-hmm. which Hogwarts house are you, which district are you, whatever. And it kind of always is a little reductive of like what a person actually is. You're not usually defined by like one or two traits. You're more complicated than that. And that's something that's interesting because it comes a lot with, like, particularly from, like, 2000 or actually 1996 to about 2000, like, 10-ish is when, you know, we had Harry Potter, we had Sears and Fortune events, we had Percy Jackson. They were all very, very similar in that way. And we've kind of gone to the dodo in the sense of, like, we haven't really sort. We haven't had a lot of sorting things recently. I think Divergent was, like, where it sort of stopped, where people were like, this is getting silly. (laughs) But, you know, it's so interesting because... When you think about like adolescence um, as a as a stage of the lifespan, the most important thing that we're trying to do when in adolescence is find our social group, like right, find our exactly. tribe, you know. And I think that's why that resonates. And now that I'm I'm reading the second of these book series, what I love about it is, you know, the first book is very much um, here are these everyone fits into this little cabin and everyone fits into this little stereotype. And a lot of times we do that in adolescence because that makes it easier for us to to try and right, find our have, people. like a click. It makes us kind of comfortable. Isn't that also like with our brains, like back in the day when we we're all like tribes, like, oh man, if we get eaten by a monster, our tribe will protect us. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. So finding our, like, think about it. Adolescence back in those days didn't have parents who were still alive. So if you didn't have a social group, you were going to be dead. Do you basically. find that your your kids strongly identify with like a, a cabin? I, I think they're, they've they been afraid to tell us who their godly parent is oh. because we're their actual <laughs> You're their parents. Real parent, yeah. I'm just realizing we talked about their Hogwarts house all the time, but, but I don't think we've ever talked about their godly parent. Well, Hogwarts is a little easier because there's only four of them. Well, like godly parents can get a little unwieldy. But like you said, you know, people tend to be like, like, am I like I'm kind of a raven puff, you know, mm-hmm. or that. And I, I, what I like about the second series of Percy Jackson is how it kind of opens up the world a little bit. And you kind of get to see, you know, Piper is a child of Aphrodite, but oh, I don't want to spoil too much. OK, let's just say you get to see um, some characters outside of the stereotype. You you see some characters in a cabin act in a way that's not typical. So you kind of like start to realize, and that's so important when kids become a, adults, that's one of the things you have to learn. Especially with like Percy Jackson, not only do you have like these kids coming in that have like their cabins and stuff, but they all have, that's really unique to Percy Jackson because they pretty much right off the bat, this isn't even like a subtle thing. It's like they, all of them have like ADHD, dyslexia, but they also have their own personal issues, which is so striking to me, especially after reading Stormlight Archive where you have like a character like Kaladin who's broken from the beginning Mm -hmm. and just like oh man this is this is so sad it's so interesting to have them like in a YA book where it's really interesting because the message of the book is like it's okay if you have differences but also it's okay to talk about them and Mm -hmm. have your friends and be accepted how do you guys feel about that especially with with your kids has that been something that's you know you guys have talked about or has that been something that gets brought up a little bit we have kids with ADHD in our in our family and we've talked a lot about the theory that ADHD is is not a disability. It's not, I don't I don't like that it's called you know attention deficit disorder. It really it's just a different way of your brain working and a brain that has different strengths. And in my case, I'm actually the one with ADHD mm-hmm. in the family, and we have uh, some of those issues with our children as well. Uh, and in my experience, I was diagnosed with it, uh, and my parents decided not to do sort of any of the medicines or interventions or medications. And it actually ended up, although it was a struggle for a little while, and it ended up being very advantageous because it sort of taught me how to use my quote unquote disability of ADHD. And I I got very good at learning how to sort of trick it and harness and use my brain in certain ways. But um, we talk to our kids about that fairly often. And And I love how the book addresses it like that. Yeah, absolutely. 
it's good to see it put in a positive light. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, they show it in a positive light, but also it's something that no one ever makes fun of. It's like, oh, you have ADHD? Well, I have ADHD. Yeah, it's so normalized. It, it's, it's, like, it's, it's really it, kind of it refreshing. It normalizes it. Yeah, it, it's great because, like, as a kid, like, I grew up, I actually have dyslexia and ADHD. Mm-hmm. So, like, having, like, growing up as a kid, like, this is the first time like, I really felt like, oh, my God, like, this is a book series that really, you know, gets me. And also, much like you, um, Chad, it's like, I have ADHD and I've used, like, when it comes to, like, editing podcasts, like it's helped me so much of just like, I can do things really quickly. <laughs> yep. And then mm-hmm. afterwards, I'm like, I don't want to do anything anymore. Oh, look, a squirrel. <laughs> oh. It's like, I think the joke is like, I feel like I'm like Tara Vangian. Like I have good, good Zach sometimes. And then, you know, big brain Tara Vangian. And then I'm like, I don't want to do anything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I find that as well. There are periods of time with my ADHD where I can, outwork and outperform anybody and stay incredibly focused and just get tons and tons of stuff done. And then there are days where nothing, like nothing's going to happen. (laughs) No. That's pretty relatable. Especially like teaching that to kids very early on is probably one of the most important things because it's, you know, if you have parents like they don't, not not that they don't get it, but it's like they don't know how to help their kids. Like this is a really good tool to help explain it without you know a doctor explaining it or someone like that kid might feel intimidated to talk to like a psychiatrist or somebody about it. And this is like a really great middle ground. The way the way that it's like framed in the beginning, Percy feels so much like he's an outsider and is like, oh, I always mess up and I don't fit in with these people and I don't do well in school. And then as soon as he finds out he's a demigod at first, he's like confused. But going to Camp Half-Blood really makes him realize like, oh, there are people like me and this isn't necessarily a detriment, which is I don't know. I I don't personally have ADHD, but I like I'm neurodivergent in other ways. And like, I think that would have been really cool to read as like a 12 year old who felt like I was a weirdo. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. The other part of it, too is that, you know, we tell our children this, uh, but your mom also always told you you were beautiful and you didn't believe it until somebody gave you some positive attention Mm -hmm. other than them. Mm -hmm. Nobody nobody really necessarily is going to take what their parents say about them, particularly when it's positive, and really, really, you know, take it to heart. But when they see it represented in other media in a more broad sense, they're more likely to accept what we as parents tell them. Yeah, it's all. It's also nice because, like, in the series, Percy has like a a great um, parental figure in Sally, and I I wonder how you feel about that. Like, um, it's sort of like I guess reassuring to like have this this figure who accepts Percy for as he is, and I mean, it's kind of similar too because she's like, oh, of course he he's like, oh, of course you would say that because you're my mom, and it kind of takes him going to Camp Half Blood to realize that she was telling and, truth the and whole time. Her. Yeah. Well, I think it really speaks to to the power of of having a positive parent when you compare, you know, Percy with some of the other characters that didn't have that um, and, and how well adjusted he is versus some of the others. So, you know, as a parent, a lot of times as, as well adjusted as a demigod, as well adjusted <laughs> as a, a semi uh, all powerful demi- demigod can be from a broken home. Yeah. From a broken home. Now, Liz is Sally Jackson, God tier mom, from your mom perspective. She's pretty awesome. I'm gonna say, you know, um, yeah, she's pretty awesome. And I and I and I I love Paul Blovis. Yeah, he really grew on me actually, because at first they kind of present him as a real dweeb, but he's he's kind of a sweet character. Hey, there's nothing wrong with a hot dweeb. <laughs> I mean, what? I for some reason I think I picture him as um God, what is that that character for Giles from um, Oh from Buffy. From Anthony Buffy, Stewart yeah, Head. that's kind of like the archetype I'm picturing. <laughs> For me, I think of Eugene Levy. Oh, that's a different direction than <laughs> that is a, a different direction. For is sure. it the elbow patches? Is that it? No, no. She, see, Sally Jackson really has a hots for people with really big bushy eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> At least pick Dan Lovey. He's a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so I always saw um, Kurt Russell as Poseidon. I don't think I had thought of That's a good choice. The funny thing is in the movie, they got Sean Bean to be Zeus. And I guess he didn't die in the movie, but it killed the movie. That, yeah, I, I'm i trying not to think about the The movie. casting in that movie is pretty bonkers, <laughs> honestly. Oh, Yo, yeah. Who, um, the person that plays Hermes is... Um, Nathan Fillion. Right. That's true. Which is crazy to me, but it makes sense. Have your kids watched the movies or you kept them sheltered? I think that they were told early on that the movies are terrible. They've probably seen parts of them. But I think we're just waiting for the the, the inevitable reboot. Yeah, we kind of are too. There's like some 
whisperings of possibly a series or something like that. And obviously we would cover that on the show if that's the case. But yeah, the movies, they kind of are roasted by everyone, including the people who uh, made the musical. Now, Liz, I have a question for you. And this is very near and dear to my heart. Is that did you make any charts from (laughs) Chrissy Jackson? (laughs) This book lends itself so well to charts. But let me tell you something. There are so many already out there. Um, really? You know, if oh my gosh, just Google Percy Jackson charts. I am not kidding. There are so there are like a dozen pie charts that come up right on the top. You know, alignment charts and oh, there's an amazing. Per, I'm looking at it right now. Percy Jackson and the Olympians personality chart based oh. on the the classic like INFJ personality oh, right. test. like the Myers Briggs. Oh wait, what's I what's INFJ? I want to know because I think that that one's mine. <laughs> <laughs> that's um i think that's hold on that's introverted oh gosh no i know but i'm saying the uh which character is <laughs> oh which character okay um let's see i want to say it's nico. infj is hold on i'm trying to oh i could it. see it being nico i think it's percy oh look oh. at that that's it i'm percy yes <laughs> yeah that's percy but it's interesting because you could have all these things, especially in Percy Jackson, where it warns charts, because mm-hmm. there's so many different, you know, child studies you can easily do for Percy Jackson from just like, you know, how do you give a kid these huge you know, responsibilities to basically like childhood traumas, but also like survivor's guilt. It just runs the trauma gambit. Absolutely. And and I love that, you know, YA books that have that because there's something for like just pretty much every young person can relate to. Um, and it doesn't shy away from any topics. Now, Liz, in this reread through, was there something that kind of like stood out to you, especially just rereading this book series? Because you read it in like four days. I did. Was there? <laughs> That's such a difference between our podcast. <laughs> like it's totally the opposite. Um, so I would say going, diving right into the second series, um, I was really struck by the just the tonal shift and how much kind of more mature and dark it is, but also how that's something I really loved about the the Harry Potter series was how that series grew as Harry grew. It benefits with the readers growing up with Harry. Absolutely. And and just the shift between the 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 first and second series of the Percy Jackson books and and again how thematically it it addresses more mature issues as well. And so I I'm kicking myself for never having read the second series before and now I'm just tearing it up. And one thing that we talk about a lot on this channel is pretty much like relationships. Like what is what is a relationship? And it's one of those things that can be really hard to talk about, especially from from us as adults, because we don't want to you know, really talk about it because it's like, how does one define a relationship? And mm-hmm. in your opinion, as like an adult and also like as a parent, uh, how do you see like the relationship between, you know, Annabeth and Percy and Percy and Rachel and all those wonderful you know friendships relationships the love triangles and all the ships you know i i appreciate it because what you see a lot in ya literature is this idea of finding the one and when you find the one everything instantly clicks into place and there may be like external problems but there's no internal issues like it's just it's meant to be and if you find them then it's meant to be and everything's just going to work out and and i like that percy has you know doubts about his relationship with Annabeth and then he meets Rachel and he thinks he might love her too and then Annabeth thinks she loves Luke you know and and it's it, that's that's real like when you're an adolescent like relationships are sticky and they're a mess yeah. for a long time you know I think Zach and I have had a hard time sometimes parsing the relationships because you know it's easy to forget kind of how your emotions work when you're like a 12 year old so we'll be like oh Annabeth is being so ridiculous being jealous of like Rachel in this situation or whatever like and then I have to take a step back and be like right they're teenagers they act petulant and ridiculous because that's like what you're supposed to do when you're a teenager when I was 14 I had a cutter (laughs) Like, we're irrational. <laughs> One of the things I think we do where we do a disservice to uh, to young kids, and this is in all media, it really is sort of the, giving this sort of idea of the romantic notion of you're going to find one person, lightning's going to strike, and then everything's going to be perfect from then on out. You know, birds tweeting, rabbits singing you to sleep. And and it, it's just not like that in, in, in real life. And relationships take work. 
Um, but that's a little bit harder to put forward, uh, particularly, you know, in YA novels and, you know, short television shows and, and things like that. So the fact that it's not portrayed in that way is something I think that is a service to the readership. And, and Percy is is really respectful of all the women in his life. You know, we don't have like a Twilight scenario here. Yeah, and it's also really important because the one thing I've noticed while rereading this book, because be well, we've been reading this book, I've reread it to catch some things, is that I've noticed that Rick Riordan makes a very specific thing of talking about both the physical relationship, but also like, you know, the mental relationship. Like, oh, you need to be codependent in so many different ways, but also it's like, what is like love and what is a relationship? Is it, you know, you kiss and hold hands or is it something like, yeah, you get me, you got this. Like, that's why I think Mm -hmm. it's so important to have like, Rachel is kind of almost like the mental relationship, whereas like Annabeth is more. Of- He's like infatuated with her. Yeah. Well, that we also talked about this, too, that their like dynamic has a lot to do with like the stakes of the circumstances that they're like hanging out. Because like every time Percy's with Annabeth, they're mostly like at camp and there's monsters everywhere and the stakes seem really high. Well, like most of the time when he's with. Rachel, there's kind of more like downtime and he gets to be more of a normal kid again, which is a a totally different dynamic. Well, there's also, you know, Percy being a a demigod and Rachel being a mortal for a lot of that. Like there's sort of an inherent um, imbalance of powers there, which I wonder maybe that makes him feel more comfortable around her versus with Annabeth. He's he's on more unsure footing. Well, actually, I think in some ways he feels like threatened by both of them in different (laughs) ways, which is kind of funny. Yeah, because because Annabeth is like such an intimidating, like strong demigod. And then and then Rachel, too, even though she's immortal, like she has like a like the the ability of, I guess, seeing through the mist. And she's Mm -hmm. very smart and like talks about all these esoteric things that he doesn't understand because he's kind of not as cultured in that way. So I think he's that's the one through line with Percy is he's pretty much always like babbling and uncomfortable around girls that are cooler <laughs> than him. He's like, ah, da, da, what are you talking yeah, about? Da, da, da. Uh, <laughs> girls, yes. <laughs> Which I guess is probably really relatable to like some awkward teen boy reading these books. Absolutely. Probably. Uh, now, Liz and Chad, who are your favorite characters? I guess for Chad, it's like I'm guessing from like hearing your your son saying all this stuff. And from you, Liz, from rereading the books, who has been your favorite character so far of the Gods of Olympus series? Oh, I mean, I I love Rachel. I, I love Rachel Elizabeth Dare. I mean, I love her I've name. I love her red hair. I I mean, yeah, I totally. If if I had to be one of the characters, that's who I would be. Well, you have to take mine with sort of a grain of salt, but just based on the descriptions and and the blow by blow secondhand uh, details that I've gotten, I would I would think it would be Annabeth. Yeah, we kind of ping pong between those two actually. That which is it's kind of speaks to Rick Riordan's ability to write a good female character. Is that it's kind of you're like given a a plethora of good female characters to choose from. They're like have a lot of complicated, interesting personality traits. And I know I think this also speaks for both me and Liz is like there isn't a character that's a girl. It's like I I love playing with knives and I also wear pants. Yes. Yes. Oh like the not like other girls kind of like (laughs) Yes. Yeah, they don't really he really avoids that, which he could have definitely gone that way with Annabeth or even with Mm -hmm. Rachel too. But I think they're yeah, or Tali even like all of them are like strong in different ways, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it like like falls into that borderline misogynist like oh well they're only cool because they're not feminine or they're only cool because they subvert this idea like they're kind of able to be complicated people who are both you know they could like girly things they could like fighting they could like art there's there's not really like one like superficial idea of what a teen girl is supposed to act like and even um piper and again i, w- I won't spoil stuff but sh- but this is a character who's a little bit like that who's a little bit anti makeup and looking fit but she's that way for a reason not just because oh because that makes her cool you know that somehow is like the defining characteristic of her that makes her a desirable person you know that's what drives me crazy by virtue of that and only that exactly yeah Yeah, and also one other thing that really speak about here is that all these characters seem so realistic like you can actually pick them out of the page and you can easily see them walking around new york which, especially in, like, fantasy, you either have, like, for a lot of the times you have, like, these almost, like, power fantasies where you can have a Mary Sue or a Gary Stu. Like, mm-hmm. none of them except for Mi- Percy kind of verges into, like, he that d- Sometimes, a bit. yeah, especially when he uses certain powers where, like, oh, the- when did you have this really strong power all of a sudden? Well, and, if, you know, a little bit, if you're you're in a YA fantasy novel, that's kind of the fun of it. You know, if you're going to 
fantasize about being a, a demigod, then you kind of want to be a powerful one. Oh, yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah. Um, sort of circling back a little bit to the stuff that we said about like Annabeth and Rachel, I'm sure that you must like reflect on that as like parents, like parents of girls. Do you think that like it's it's sort of like good for them to see representation in that way? Absolutely. You know, I, I like, you know, both of them. And, and I think another thing that that kids who are generally of the age where they're discovering these books are kind of dealing with the the struggle of finding out who they are outside of their family. And that's what I see in Annabeth and Rachel's stories, especially, you know, Rachel is trying to distinguish herself from her father, who has a lot of actions that she doesn't agree with and be her own person. Annabeth obviously is going through the same thing. So kind of figuring out, you know, parental relationships. And obviously if your, your parent is a, an Olympian God, it's a, it's a very complicated relationship, but kind of finding their own identity and um, as as girls, and I can't speak, probably boys have the same thing. But for me, as a girl, I feel like there's so much societal pressure at that time of your life to, as you're trying to figure out who you are, to, to be a certain thing. And so it's really neat in this story that you've got so many um, female characters that are that are different and that y- unique and finding out in a way that's um, that's really relatable. Yeah, especially when it comes to, like, setting in, like, a summer camp. Like, I used to go to a summer camp a lot, especially, like, being, like, a counselor at a summer camp and how it was always co-ed. And it's, like, very, like, right off the bat, people were just, like, they didn't care, you know, boys, girls. They were just all campers and they were trying to have fun, which something that happens a lot in this is, it's like, everyone is, like, They're equalized. Equal. And, yeah. They're equalized. And it's so interesting because you don't have, like, the girl camp is across the river mm. and the boy camp here. And it's so fascinating, especially with here. It's, like... Uh, I, I got a chance to go to Camp Half Blood Los Angeles, and it was the nerdiest thing I've ever done before. But like, I was crying That's saying because something. like, oh, I've done Quidditch before, but um, <laughs> uh, but what was I saying? But it, it's crazy because you can see that even in like real life, when all these kids uh, came to this camp, and I was like looking at them learning how to sword fight, and then they had like a D and D session going. And that that's what made me really cry: is these kids playing D and D. Can but I you go had, to that like, camp? Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I was like, Can as a I kid, like, because it's funny because, like, as a kid, like, even like with these books, is that learning's cool, and also it must be interesting, especially with like a, a lot of Percy Jackson, like, looking at these myths and like really delving into like Greek mythology. I know later on in the second series they delve into something a little more different, and it must be interesting as parents, like, do your kids like, Dad, Mom, take me to like an art museum? I want to learn about myths and stuff. Well, I will say we did, um, we went on a vacation this year to a place where they had um, Roman ruins and my kid ate it up. We toured this old Roman ruin, it's a place called Glanum, and I did not think, it was like hot, okay, the sun is like beating down on us, we're hiding under our hats, we're melting, and we're just walking around these old, and I was like, I'm done, I mean, I was I was bored way before he was, he... <laughs> Like, absolutely, there was an actual um, a temple to Hercules there with it was like the you know the original carvings. You could see the name of Hercules carved in. It. I mean, he loved it. Um, so yeah, I would say I think every kid has a stage where we learn about mythology in school and we get really super into it for a little bit. But um, but definitely, I think these books have prolonged that stage in our kids for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Now, have your kids asked, can we go to like the Hoover Dam or somewhere <laughs> that's like so batty that's like, wait, why do you guys want to go there? Oh, because Percy was there. <laughs> no, they've, they've never asked to go to the Hoover Dam. But like I said, I, I was surprised at how, how um, he jumped at going to Glanum with my dad, who is the biggest um, kind of mythology history nerd on the planet. And like they just it was just funny that that my dad was like, does anyone want to go, you know, to Glanum and. By any chance is your dad named Mr. Brunner? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Not that I know of. Uh, on the other side, I have asked to go to the Hoover Dam several times. <laughs> yeah, watch out for redheaded girls. <laughs> you have hidden depths, Chad. No, I've just been alive for a long time. <laughs> um, now, I have a question for you guys, because we're all fantasy readers here. We we read phone book fantasy. Well, we I read mean, books that... Well, you three. For, Oh, yes. Oh, you're Uh, in. I'm sorry. You're in the club now. 
Yeah, I guess because of Fantasy. I read a lot of like young adult, but I don't really read. Hey, I'm trying to get you. B, I've tried to get you time and time again to read The Name of the Wind. One of these days, it's going to succeed, and you're going to probably <laughs> like it. It's I happening. I have too many to be read things in my pile right now. Uh, but uh, my question is, because you know we're all huge fantasy people, and the interesting thing about YA fantasy is, I'll go to the store, I'll go to Barnes and Noble, and YA fantasy is just labeled YA fantasy. There's no like. You know, subgenres like I think of like subgenres like I look at the Dresden Files, urban fantasy. Oh, I can look at the Calculating Stars, and that's like just regular like historical science fiction. Now, when it comes to Percy Jackson, how would you like label it as a subgenre? Because branching into like YA stuff, you get branched into things like I- I've noticed a lot of I'll pick up like a YA book and it's like, oh wait, this is just straight up romance. There's there's no magic or a dragon here. Come on, guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would definitely say it's urban. Uh, if I had to pick pick a label for it, um, yeah, urban fantasy. See, I think it's almost like kid light epic fantasy a little bit because you learn well, so much about yeah, things. The epic aspect of mythology, I guess. Um, there's a lot going on genre wise. I feel like it, it's hard to narrow it down. Yeah, I, I guess I think of epic fantasy as being more kind of traditional high fantasy, um, elves and. And dwarves and stuff. Well, maybe that's just my conception. I of it. see. I think my definition for like epic fantasy is like you have so much world building. Like you're pretty much in like a brand new world, and this is kind of like where it's at here. Like you learn the nitty gritty about mythology, but also you learn like everything is so different from the mortal world. Especially like you have satyrs. Actually, I guess you'd have different races. You have like satyrs, dryads, nymphs, everything in between. Especially you have the gods. Like this is it's it's interesting because even with urban fantasy, I was actually getting a lot of like. Dresden Files, if you've ever read that, it's like mm-hmm. so oh, yeah. over the top. It's like I can see Percy Jackson being in the Dres- Dresden File universe very easily. They're very, they're very similar, actually. Even that kind of it. prose style is similar. Yeah, they've made the comparison to American Gods for obvious reasons too. Like they're sort of retroactively turning existing mythology into something else with like a new setting. But I wouldn't encourage. Young readers of Percy <laughs> Jackson to read American Gods. No, I wouldn't either. No, no I would not. Oh no, I'd no, wait no a few we're not years. Yeah, that much at all. like the Stephen King thing, you gotta wait a little bit. <laughs> no, that just reminds me of like this kid. I was like walking through the fantasy section. He wasn't even tall enough to reach the top shelf. He was trying to pick Game of Thrones up. I was like, oh, no, this is bad. <laughs> Did someone get this kid's parent? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He probably would have been turned off after like what a kid falls from a tower. I'm a kid. But then know. again, there's like the, the yeah. Maurice Sendak approach where he's like, if it's true, tell them. And he's just like, whatever, read ho- these horrible things. They'll deal with it. Which, I mean, he had a rough go of it. So I don't know if I'd take his advice. Uh, what other fantasy books or what other YA books do you recommend um, maybe some of our listeners or p- adults should possibly look at for their kids? Hmm. What have I read recently? I mean, obviously, um, Harry Potter... Well, obviously. This little indie unknown. <laughs> it, it's it's not that important. I mean, I'm going to go to the Wizarding World like next week. Not that big a deal. Ah. We're we are going next month, and we are really excited. Um, yeah. Just make sure that you're going to be getting your butter beer and your wands, and your wallets are going to cry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll start to give you a little yeah yeah, little yeah. Bit of time. So uh, it's harder for me to recommend things that are more towards the younger side, uh, but I would say I think the Brandon Sanderson stuff fits actually quite well. Yes. Uh, you know, our ten year old read Skyward. Skyward, yeah. Yeah, and enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. I love Skyward. Skyward is actually perfect for like YA. I just finished the second one two weeks ago. It was really good. Yeah, and the stand he's got several standalone novels, so you're not committing yourself to a five thousand page yeah. you know, epic. I, so I think that that fits. Another one that I read recently that I think would do well for again, sort of the more, you know, teenage readers is the Murderbot Diaries, actually. Oh, I love the Murderbot books. Yeah, that's another sci fi. Someone from your Facebook group recommended it to me, like fine, I'll finally read it. I was like, Oh, this is this is fun. This yeah. is great. I would say, too, if you like kind of these, uh, the idea of a traditional story being brought into a, a, a modern day or even a futuristic setting, The Lunar Chronicles by Marissa Meyer, she takes like um, fairy tales and sets them in a sci-fi setting. Oh, that's cool. So like Cinderella is a girl with a mechanical leg kind of thing. I think the one that I'd recommend is uh, Jim Butcher's Codex Alexa because it's ancient Rome with Pokemon. Oh, oh. yes. 
Yes, that's a good suggestion. That's a lot to unpack. <laughs> okay, there's a whole story behind that. Like someone told him, like on a forum, like people read books because of you know the writer, not the what's the content of it. Mm-hmm. And he was like, "Nah, give me the two stupidest ideas you got." Okay, uh, the ancient lost legion and Pokemon. Fine, I'll write a book about it, and it sold. It was a bestseller. Wow. <laughs> I love when someone does something successful out of spite. It just really, it it totally is on brand. <laughs> hey, spite keeps you warm at night. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have any books you'd recommend, B? A fantasy? I don't know if I, I like I said, I well, don't it really. it could be anything. I don't really, re- I mean, like, YA? I, I mean, like, obviously, we're always recommending Unfortunate Events, because I do think that there's some overlap. It's sort of like these, like, the weird, like, kids who were like oh well harry potter is cool but i want something a little different like i feel like you either got siphoned into a percy jackson kid or an unfortunate events kid you're an outlier because you ended up being both but that's definitely something i would <laughs> oh man b did you hear that do, 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 do. i think you just <laughs> threw me underneath the bus <laughs> well i said you're an outlier. i said that you you ended up liking two book series which is instead of having one define you like i did when i was a kid <laughs> no this is like god tier mode i loved harry potter percy jackson and series of unfortunate events. Mm. I don't know how we became friends. I feel like <laughs> this is like me and my friends. Like growing up, I was a huge Star Trek fan, and most of my other friends were Star Wars fans. Two and my... houses, both alike in dignity. <laughs> yeah, like my my friends told me that's like, yeah, if we met in real life when you were like in kindergarten, we probably would have beaten you up with our lightsabers. I'm like, oh, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Paul. But that's the great thing about Percy Jackson is, is like you can make fun of it, and you can have so much fun with it. And also, you can take it serious or you can take it not serious. Because that's the mm-hmm. great thing about Rick Riordan's work is that he you get so many different influences. Yeah. Even this last book, which has been darker than all the other ones, there always is a little glimmer of comedic relief, which is kind of nice, especially for our show. Because sometimes there'd be like an episode where we'd be like, oh, there's a lot of... A lot of death and sadness in this one, but then there's always like a little weird joke, which almost makes it weirder, but you know, it's fine. And that's the great thing about Rick Riordan. He's such a personable person. It's like you look at other authors and like Rick Riordan seems like the person that writes, I don't even know. He looks like he writes textbooks. I feel like he writes something <laughs> like milk toast. He has such a dadly energy. I feel mm-hmm. like every yeah. picture I see of him, like you're such a dad and also such a teacher, which makes sense because he's both. But like mm-hmm. that very much tracks. I'm just imagining it's like you put him in like a police lineup with all of like the fancy authors and say, which one of you wrote Percy Jackson? And the one person didn't know. You probably couldn't tell. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe you might. I think that'd be the one exception. The, the, the dadliest dad, the one that wears Crocs with socks. Well, I feel like a lot of like fantasy authors are more kind of like wizardly looking than he mm-hmm. is. Yeah. <laughs> with like long beards. There are a lot of epic that. beards. Yeah. yeah. A lot of fantasy beards. authors. Or I guess in the case of Pat Roffice, he's just like, I just was lazy, don't want to shave. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's borderline wizardly. <laughs> Well, I mean, Scott Lynch looks like a D&D wizard. He does. So, yes. he do- Wait, does he grow a beard? Yes, he yeah. has a beard. Oh, my God. We saw him at a, a co- at a convention. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate you guys taking your time out to answer some yeah, of our thank questions. You. It was really awesome meeting you guys. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much. So you can find us just by searching for the Duke and Duchess podcast. Ignore all the Harry and Meghan stuff. And then that's where you'll find us. <laughs> so- oh, right. <laughs> So if you search for it uh, on Facebook, we're at the DND, uh, excuse me, on Twitter, we're at the DND podcast and on Facebook at the Duke and Duchess. Really where most of our contingent tends to hang out and spend time is on our Facebook group page. So if you go into Facebook and search for the Duke and Duchess podcast group, uh, you'll find a great community of folks to hang out with and discuss fantasy and sci-fi literature. So thank you guys so much. Yeah, thanks for having us. Well, guys, I'm Zach. And I'm B. And I'm Chad. I'm the Duchess. And let's keep staying mortal, guys. See ya. 